Climate change, genesis of a threat. The temperature of the Earth is remarkably stable. That is to say, if you measure the temperature everywhere in the world all at once, and then average those results together, you will get a number that is always the same. Of course, in any given moment, some places on Earth are very hot and others are very cold, and individual temperatures will vary with day and night as the Earth rotates on its axis and with the seasons of the year as the Earth revolves around the Sun. But they all average out to be the same number. Every day, every month, every year. That number might change less than one degree in 10,000 years. In fact, the average temperature of the Earth is one of the most stable numbers in nature at just a tad below 59 degrees Fahrenheit all the time. Like the rising of the Sun and the passing of the seasons, this is a fact you can really depend upon. And for good reason. All the plants and animals on Earth have adapted to the temperature of their local environment, as well as its fluctuations through the seasons. From blossoming of flowers in the spring, to shedding of leaves in the fall, from gathering of food in the summer, to hibernating underground in the winter, plants and animals are exquisitely well adapted to the baseline temperature and its seasonal fluctuations. A good analogy for the Earth comes from my world of medicine. The human body also seeks a stable temperature of 98.6 degrees and vigorously defends it. A two degree rise in our body temperature is defined as a fever, a disease state that prompts an investigation to determine the cause. A five degree increase severely impairs us. An eight degree increase can be fatal. Why? Because our cells, organs, and tissues have evolved to work best at our baseline temperature, just like the living organisms in the environment. Biology and climate, a stable marriage for the ages, until it isn't. Let's take a closer look. Most people know the carbon cycle by heart. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide, or CO2, and breathe out oxygen. Using energy from the sun through photosynthesis, plants incorporate those carbon atoms into their structures, their roots, trunks, and branches, and then discard the oxygen. Thus, over large spans of time, plants have depleted the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and enriched it with pure oxygen. As the trees died and were covered by the earth, their carbon atoms became trapped underground as organic material, buried forever. Or so it seemed. Over millions of years, as the atmosphere became more suitable for human life and temperatures moderated at a stable level, the weight of the Earth compressed all that organic material into fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. When we humans came along, we realized that there was a lot of energy bound up in those deposits if we could just drill for them or dig them up, which we did, of course. Unfortunately, the combustion of those fuels has reversed the process of photosynthesis, returning carbon dioxide to the atmosphere in huge quantities while releasing massive amounts of energy to produce the electricity for our power grid. In this way, the burning of fossil fuels has been undoing the work of all the Earth's trees and plants. In effect, we have been running the Earth's historical clock in reverse and at a blistering pace to return our atmosphere to its previous state of millions of years ago, when the planet was much, much hotter. Today, more than 33 billion tons of carbon dioxide gas are released into the air each year, which increased the CO2 concentration by about two parts per million annually. That CO2 is a greenhouse gas is well established. That atmospheric CO2 levels are steadily rising has been confirmed by direct measurement. Sampling air bubbles trapped in polar ice, scientists have determined that over the past 400,000 years, the carbon dioxide level had always stayed below 300 parts per million. Since 1950, however, the CO2 level has been over 300 every year, rising steadily to the current level, which is now over 400 parts per million. Based on the increasing levels of greenhouse gases, scientists predicted that the global temperatures would rise as a result. By the mid-1990s, the voices had swelled to a chorus. Let's review whether those predictions came true. The best evidence for the warming of the Earth comes from global land and sea temperature measurements that are regularly reported by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a U.S. government agency that produces gold standard evidence about the environment. 
Based on these measurements, here is the rise in the average global temperature over the past century, presented in five-year intervals to dampen annual fluctuations. What a stunning display of evidence. It is apparent in this graph that average global temperatures have increased by nearly 2 degrees Fahrenheit over this period. More important, the rise in those temperatures appears to be accelerating. While it took 75 years to gain the first degree, it took only 25 years to gain the second. Thus, it appears that our Earth is running a fever, about 2 degrees above our baseline, a diseased state. So here is a truth that cannot be denied. Global warming is no longer a prediction. It actually came true. At this point, climate change is as established a fact as any in our natural world. We are just as sure of global warming as we are sure that the Earth rotates on its axis or that it revolves around the Sun. And there is no major scientific academy that disputes the evidence. You would have to place your head deep in the sand to miss this truth. And some have. Climate change is not science. It's religion. I do not believe that human activity is causing these dramatic changes to our climate the way these scientists are portraying it. Climate change occurs no matter what. Um, the question is, can the federal government, can and should the federal government do something about it? And I would argue the federal government, with all these tax and regulatory schemes, can't. So Obama's talking about all of this with the global warming and that, and a lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, okay? It's a hoax. Sometimes a platform is worth a thousand words. The following are excerpts from the Democratic and Republican Party platforms in the 2016 election cycle. Democrats. Climate change is an urgent threat and a defining challenge of our time. Fifteen of the 16 hottest years on record have occurred this century. While Donald Trump has called climate change a hoax, 2016 is on track to break global temperature records once more. Republicans. The Environmental Protection Agency has rewritten laws to advance the Democrats' climate change agenda. This is the triumph of extremism over common sense, and Congress must stop it. We reject the agendas of both the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. How unfortunate. One political party embraces the truth, and the other vigorously denies it, and blocks all progress to address it. As it turns out, the genesis of this global threat the root cause of our continued exacerbation of climate change is not the carbon cycle, it's the election cycle. It is our political process that causes us to fail to respond, which is unusual for us humans. When Allied nations faced mass destruction in World War II, we banded together to prevail against the odds. When humankind confronted the risks of suffering and death from smallpox and polio, we developed vaccines the greatest public health intervention in history. When our planet faced the threat of worldwide starvation from overpopulation, we drew upon science to increase crop yields through the Green Revolution and save billions of lives. We humans are used to dealing with existential threats. We are incredibly resourceful and have a strong track record of working together to solve our serious problems. Yet by ignoring the peril of climate change, we face global disruption that could lead to international conflict, disease, and famine all over again. Why would we choose to revisit problems we have already solved? What's so special about this threat? The root cause of our failure to confront climate change is a system defect in our political process. That defect, that glitch, is private campaign financing, which gives rich and powerful interests unnatural control over our democratically elected leaders, so that they no longer bend to the will of the people or do what is right for our world. The oil and gas industry have much to lose if we cut down on consumption of fossil fuels, and those forces have a vice-like grip on the Republican Party through private campaign donations. And unfortunately, the entire world is paying the price. Until we, the American people, decide to buy our government back, we will continue to ignore climate change at the peril of our children and our grandchildren. A physician who ignores the truth can lose a patient. An influential world leader who ignores the truth can kill a planet. Hi, I'm Nate Link, and I hope you were enlightened by this video essay on the genesis of climate change. For more on the unseemly relationship between money and politics, the true genesis of our plight, 
please check out my video essay on campaign financing at snickersnack.com. Thanks.